welcome to the wonderful world of English language classroom, learners of class 12. Today we do the first lesson from your supplementary reader, Vistos. Learners, you are aware and you know that this is a supplementary reader meant for extensive reading and reading for pleasure. So learners, we will discuss in such a way that you read the story and reread the story in order to understand, analyze, interpret the ideas and extrapolate. Learners, to do today's lesson with me is Dr. Amit Ranjan, member of faculty, a member of faculty from Central Institute of Educational Technology and CRT. And we will together, of course, with you learners, we'll do this lesson. Amit, let me begin with asking you a question and of course to your learners. Have you ever uh, heard of strange stories which you feel that and it, it's unbelievable? Thanks a lot Meghnathan for that question. It's an intriguing question and I have not just heard such stories, I have also experienced them. So for example, I went to Pune University where there is this grave of Alice Richmond, a 26 year old girl who died in Bombay. That's another story altogether. I'll not get into it. But on her grave was written, Alice Richman, born 1856, Melrose, South Australia, died January 14, 1882 of cholera. After that, the next part of the epitaph says, died at this spot and is buried at this very spot. Oh, it's, it's interesting how a person uh, is buried in the same uh, spot she, uh, he died. Exactly, but a year later, when I get obs got obsessed with this um, idea in the grave and started researching on it, a year later when I returned, the thing was missing. It was not written on the grave. How? It's strange, right? <laughs> why, why, did, why did they remove it or? No, I had just imagined it. And a couple of years later, I went to Meerut Sardana, hmm. where there is um, this church built in the Italian style by Begum Samru. There, there is a grave of a priest which says exactly the same thing, died at this spot and is buried at this very spot. But, but so I had a premonition of something that is going to happen a couple of years later. Oh, fine. I was hallucinating. Or but whatever. it was not there in uh, Pune. It was not there in Pune. But, so uh, learners, uh, sometimes <coughs> we dream in which uh, we ourselves appear, appear uh, in the dream, but you couldn't believe that. Oh. Uh, I, I suppose I am an old priest like or I am an old man or old farmer this kind of uh, dream sometimes exactly. I also have experience mm -hmm. then when we tell people they said no no this is your uh, lost birth or something else mm. I don't know whether you believe it or not but uh, some strange things do, do happen, happen. Yeah? Indeed. Fine. Leonis and Amit we will read the short story the third level by Jack Fenney in your supplementary reader lesson one so let's first learn the objectives of the lesson or at the end of this lesson learners you will be able to read the short story the third level with understanding identify events and the main ideas of the story and also how the ideas are sequenced in order to build up a short story. The second objective learners we will appreciate the story and interpret the events and theme of the story and connect with our personal experience. The way Amit brought out some of the personal experiences of strange things, here also the narrator is going to tell us some strange feelings, strange ideas, strange happening. So we will connect with our own experience. Fine, Amit. So learners, we will now present you the story in short. So let me request Amit to read some of the events in the story. Sure. From the beginning, sure. yeah, please. So, so we'll present a quick summary in, in points, but of course there's no substitute to reading, so you should read and it's a very nice story a few times over. The narrator of the story, Charlie, a 31-year-old young man, believes that there is a third level in the Grand Central Station of New York, which everybody knows has only two levels. When he tells his psychiatrist friend, the latter opines that Charlie wants to escape from the present. For him, the present was rife with fear, insecurity and anxiety. Charlie says that he is a philatelist. A philatelist means a stamp collector. It's a new word for you to learn. Charlie says that he is a philatelist and that could 
by the psychiatrist's logic be an escape from the present. He justifies that it is not so because his grandfather used to collect stamps and so did the famous President Roosevelt also collect stamps. One day, Charlie works till late in his office and is now getting back home. Charlie decides to take the subway from the Grand Central because he wants to get home faster than the bus. His wife Louisa would be waiting for him. Charlie goes to the first level where Charlie says people take trains like the 20th century, the train that was operational between the years 1902 to 1967, ran from Grand Central in the New York City to Chicago City. Then he walks down to the second level where the suburban trains leave from and Charlie loses his way in the maze of subways and tunnels. He moves hither and thither, that is here and there, and finds himself in a new place every time. Charlie is worried and feels that the Grand Central is growing like a tree root, pushing out new corridors and staircases. He reaches a place where he finds himself alone. It is a dark, desolate tunnel where all he can hear is the echoes of his own footsteps. He continues walking through the tunnel despite the uncertainty and reaches another level which he thought was the second level. But to his surprise, it is a different place altogether. He notices that the objects there are very different. Most of the things were antique looking there. The man in the booth is wearing a green eye shade and long black sleeve protectors. The lights are dim and a sort of flickering. They have open flame gas lights and therefore the flicker. Everyone there looks and is dressed like 18, 19 something, that is 19th century people. The train, the locomotive engine is like a funnel shaped stack, the old engines. I mean, he finds in a stack of newspapers the world and the headline story about the then president Cleveland. The date on the newspaper is June 11, 1894. Charlie goes to buy tickets for Galesburg, Illinois and gives the money. Meanwhile, the narrator tells us that it was 1894 and the two world wars had not happened and people could not even think of having such wars. He gives the money to the man at the counter and the seller retorts, This is not money, mister, and if you are trying to skin me, you won't get very far. Charlie thinks, Oh, there is nothing nice about jail, even in 1894. The next day, Charlie goes to the place where he can buy old coins and currency and get some currency of 1894. However, he cannot find the Grand Central Station again anymore, though he tries multiple times. The psychiatrist feels that this was a fantasy Charlie has been living in as a form of escape and a wish fulfillment. The psychiatrist feels that it is as a result of Charlie's insecurity, fear, war, worry and all the rest of it that Charlie wanted to escape. I mean. His wife Louisa is worried and wants him never to look for the third level. Charlie on the other hand keeps trying, he is obsessed but is never able to find the third level at the Grand Central Station. In the meanwhile, his friend Sam disappears. Charlie now goes to his old stamps and finds a first day envelope. First day envelope is when people used to post newly minted stamps to themselves envelopes that had blank paper inside them. Charlie finds a letter in the first day envelope um, of his grandfather's collection and it reads. So before I read the letter, let's recapitulate that this is the present day. So the story is from 1950 and Charlie is going through the stamp collection of his grandfather. Yes. And there's a first day envelope. So a first day envelope is that there are new commemorative stamps that are printed, say President Roosevelt or President mm -hmm. Washington and then people buy it the first day it's available in the market they put it on an envelope post it to themselves so that they can they can keep it they can keep it, keep it and with the stamp so mm -hmm. that the date is also there mm -hmm. 
And so in his grandfather's collection, he finds a stamp from 1894 oh. with an envelope. But because people used to write letters to themselves, they didn't write anything inside it. But here, the letter does have something written inside it. Let's find what is that. Yeah. So there's an address written on it. 941 Willard Street, Galesburg, Illinois, July 18, 1894. Charlie, I got to wishing that you were right. Now, I got to believing that you were right. Oh. And Charlie, it's true. I found the third level. I've been here two weeks and right now, down the street at the Dallies, someone is playing a piano and they're all out in the front porch singing, seeing Nelly home. Mm -hmm. And I'm invited over for lemonade. Come on back, Charlie and Louisa. Keep looking till you find the third level. It's worth it. Believe me. This is the letter. And then the story says, the note is signed, Sam. Sam. Who is this Sam? His grandfather or his psychiatric friends? Oh, it's <laughs> very interesting. The story keeps mentioning a psychiatrist throughout mm -hmm. to who Charlie goes for consultation because he's hallucinating about mm -hmm. the third level. At the same time, he also mentions a friend who he keeps going to, Sam, his closest friend, Sam Wiener. And one day, Sam Wiener vanishes. And um, Charlie thinks that he's gone to the third level because Sam is a city boy, but could may well have gotten tired of the city and is looking for an escape to village, which is Galesburg. That's and right. this letter is from Galesburg. So Sam has actually escaped onto the third level, taken a train to Galesburg, which Charlie wanted to take, and gone to Galesburg in but 1894. Sam, yeah, Sam didn't believe when uh, Charlie told him that. Yeah. Now, I have a question for you and learners. Yeah. What about his wife? Does she believe that? So, Louisa did and did not believe that. Okay. She did believe him. Hmm. We are not given a, much of an insight into Louisa's character, except as a good confidant and a good partner of uh, um, Charlie. Wife, housewife also. She later gets worried hmm. when he cannot find. So, first time he tells that he found the third level, she's excited. Um, and which is why Sam in his letter also says... Hmm. Um, addressing both of them, not just Charlie, yeah, okay. Charlie and Louisa. Mm. But later she thinks that he's gone mad and, and she gets really worried what if her husband is losing her mind. Um, but uh, in this strange twist, we discover that the psychiatrist himself so, is found in 1894. Yes. So, uh, learners, we can't simply, I mean, <coughs> we can't simply uh, reject some, uh, when people say that, some mysterious or strange things they have experienced. We should really uh, give some respect to those uh, experiences in order to understand how a human brain works and how things happen to people. That's yeah. one. Learners, this is what uh, short stories or any literature uh, gives us and makes us uh, feel uh, why and how a person behaves the way he or she behaves. So we call it characterization or plot. Forget all those. But why Charlie behaves the way he was behaving, he is behaving, and why Sam and Lozia behave, react to his actions in the beginning, later change. So there is, this is what literature does to us. We, we reflect, we understand, and we also accept the way people behave. Fine. Amit and learners, this is, you will have to read again in order to understand it deeper. Uh, we hope and we believe that you will be doing it. Now, uh, Amit, let's take up some reflective questions sure. on the story. Sure. Come on, come on, learners. So be ready. You also think of the questions and try to answer yourself. Yeah. So we'll have a set of questions here, and then after that, we'll also have some thematic discussion towards the end. So I'll ask you a couple of questions. Maybe fine, nothing. fine, fine. First question I want to ask you is. Why did Charlie feel that there was a third level? Because he experienced it and he, on the particular day, he started late and he decided to take the subway, the train tube rather than the bus because he wanted to reach home far much faster than the by road. But unfortunately, he must have got late. He never says that. He went to the first level, second level, then 
something takes him he himself could not realize that he was being taken to the dark tunnel which he calls the dark the... tunnel and walks and he then when he hears only his footsteps then he realizes he was somewhere else then when he finds people of 19th century he said 18 something people yeah. so we don't know what took him that's what learners how the writer weaves the story without making the character realize this that is the merit the uh, we, later we will read out some of those uh, uh, usages the the sentences expressions the writer uses this is what i believe i think you, you are convinced <laughs> uh, yeah he he, um, he feels he was at the third level because that's what he tells us he it is his experiential he experienced it and that's why he but the, he the, the later the psychiatrist feels that he was hallucinating yeah, yeah. so that's the kind of what's it uh, schizophrenia i yeah, don't know yeah. uh, i'm not saying that yeah. so it may happen to us sometimes yeah yeah no we can discuss those issues also towards then how did charlie find the third level in the grand central yeah. station charlie goes to the first level then goes to the second level then all of a sudden he l- loses his way and he says i went to this place that place he says to almost 100 times i made it and every time he was reaching the wrong place then he hit a tunnel like place and he walks through then after some time he realizes some strange noise then only the noise of his footsteps then he comes out to see something that was the third level then people dressed up differently then gas lights were you know flickering you children i may not have seen such lights in those days it was early 20th century phenomena in india in some villages it may have been there i think india is completely electrified now but, but there are places uh, there sure still are some places like uh, that yeah, some places yeah. and uh, when the electricity goes this off this is also something like harry potter the platform 9 and 3 4 <laughs> yes. and, 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 and uh, there's a non existent place where you reach suddenly and that's how and that's what they here reached this is yeah. what i believe uh, based on my reading of the story sure. and as you may say it better yeah sure. come on yeah mm. okay now let me ask you amit some of the questions sure. and as ready mm. what did charlie compare the grand central station and why So Charlie compares the Grand Central Station with the roots of a tree of a huge tree because he thinks that the Grand Central Station keeps growing underneath the ground like the root of a tree that new tunnels and new subways keep growing and which is actually quite true I've been to the New York Grand Central Station and you can very easily lose your way they keep constructing new platforms um and the trains going in opposite directions of the same route may be on two very different platforms and you may need to walk half a kilometer for it so and, and underground underground all of it um and so i have spent a whole hour getting from one train to another it has oh, also great, happened great. to me and of course <clears throat> and so it is like a rhizomatic root which which yeah, is growing symbolic. inside it's like a whole city underneath fine, um, fine. Uh, the station so it's a metaphor um for an organic growth of a city yes. as well so this, this is also true of delhi metro mm-hmm. and recently uh, this uh, city of chennai so delhi metro is some of the metros <coughs> are the deepest in the world they are saying yeah. in delhi yeah. so that that's what uh, you said that metaphorically the how organically that city is growing underneath fine yeah. the next question amit and the learners what did the psychiatrist diagnose of charlie So the psychiatrist thinks that Charlie is daydreaming that because of the war the second world war has just concluded 1939 to 1945 the story is from 1950 yes. so lots of people had deep trauma so post uh, what we call PTSD now post traumatic stress disorder so you'll also find this in a lot of partition stories from India in Manto's stories or uh, joginder pal's um, story the sleepwalkers which is very similar that there is a whole city inhabited by people who are actually asleep mm-hmm. the ghosts who are walking in this new city and so um, this this post trauma condition leads to hallucinations or schizophrenia or longing for the past or being stuck in a moment of the past and so this is what the psychiatrist thinks that that charlie is deeply anxious after the war and because of the condition of modernity the fast life of new york 
where you have to go to a nine to five job, return home, run errands, uh, perform in every sphere of life, and eventually you want an escape. And even we feel that sometimes mm. living in Def a definitely, city definitely is, yeah. living in a big city. Um, also, I'd like to point out this very uh, brilliant play of Tennessee Williams called The Glass Menagerie. This is also a film which learners you must watch. It is about America in the 1950s. This is also America in the 1950s where the protagonist goes to movies night after night after night. In the day he works in a factory and in the night he has to go to a movie because he has to escape his harsh reality. So he needs this fantasy. Just to go to the theatre. Yeah. Mm. And so the psychiatrist thinks that the same thing is happening to Charlie that um, there is some sort of wish fulfillment, some kind of fantastic wish fulfillment he wants and he cannot deal with his anxiety and fear and insecurity. Um, and that so, that so he thinks he's going through this trouble. Okay, that was that was the diagnosis. Then is we also want to escape sometimes some uh, overburden, some work, some ha hardships. So I, we we are not saying that that's right or wrong. We there is something called also called psychologists say that defense mechanism. Yeah. So in order to overcome our difficulties, our wrongs, uh, we defend ourselves. We we blame others one other or escape escape. Oh. That's why. Let me also ask you another question. Why did the psychiatrist feel that Charlie was hallucinating and unhappy? It's related to the previous question. Yeah. So he also says you are unhappy. Yeah. yeah. That's what he also said that how 1950s America, in a way, the world. Uh, I wanted to tell, let me say it. In Second World War, they say that the entire Europe and Eastern Europe, uh, of course, Europe, then Soviet Union, almost every family lost at least more than one person. Means yeah. uh, that was, and most of them were males. Hmm. That means uh, in those days, women were not uh, involved in uh, fighting or army. So imagine uh, uh, the prominent person in the family, uh, the breadwinner, uh, the person who makes money, is lost. So hmm. that made the entire Europe and Soviet Union insecure. Yeah. That's what. So let me come to the question. Why did uh, the psychiatrist tell Charlie he was hallucinating one that you pointed mm. out mm. and then why he was unhappy? Yeah, so we'll have to go back to the writers of that time in America, which is Tennessee Williams again, the Glass Menagerie, like I mentioned. The protagonist wants to be a poet and in his factory job at lunchtime he writes poetry. But of course there are no takers for him, which is why he escapes to the movies. So there was nothing in these assembly line jobs that could give anyone any creative satisfaction at this point of time. And which is the burden of the world right now as well. There is so much rampant consumerism that people are uh, looking at various other avenues. So for example, there is um, uh, so much uh, consumerism that um, self-help books have become in vogue right now. Yeah, true, you know? true. And so you can see that also in Arthur Miller's Death of a Salesman, where the great American dream is derailed. So the self-help book industry actually starts in the 1950s, which you can see that is very popular here today, which is a sign of unhappiness. And inability to achieve great, uh, so-called greatness mm. or great things in yeah. life. The paradox is that if you are motivated enough to pick up a self-motivation book, should be motivated enough to motivate yourself <laughs> for other things as well. That, that Dale Carnegie is how to, <clears throat> how to win friends and influence, influence them. people and, and uh, leadership the various yeah. avatars of uh, that book um, <laughs> have come. And so in my belief, um, the, the learners and readers can believe differently, is that um, reading good literature and reading history nourishes us much more than the self-help books which are basically a rehash yeah, of rightly, the 1950s rightly, rightly, um, rightly books. Said. Uh, yeah, yeah, I agree <coughs> with you. Learners, that's why we have a lot of creative writing short stories in this book and this book is, as uh, Amit has rightly pointed out, uh, we have aimed at nurturing your emotions, feelings in the right way and through promoting reading extensive reading, reading for pleasure. Fine. Okay. The next question, uh, probably you must be asking me. Come mm. on. So now I want to ask you a question, Meghnathan. Why did Charlie feel that stamp collection is not an escape from present and the reality? Okay. Uh, first of all, let me tell you what he feels in the story. He says that stamp collection 
uh, it's not because he says that even American president does it. Hmm. Uh, that's one. Another is how, according to him, uh, Charlie, how stamp collection is an escape. It is actually not an escape. It is actually a recollection of the past hmm. and living in the present. Hmm. I'm not going back to the past altogether, forgetting the way he goes to the third level. So he believes that though oh, the psychiatrist tells that you are a stamp collector, fatalist, uh, because you want to escape from the, the real, current, present. But it's not true. That's what he feels. But let me also tell what I feel as sure. a reader of the story. Uh, stamp collection can be an escape. There are some of my students as well as some of my colleagues as teachers, uh, we are obsessed with history. Mm. Some are obsessed with the ancient past. Some of them are uh, obsessed with the recent past. Some some uh, left-leaned persons, they believe that this Russian revolution or French revolution are glorious things. Of course, they were glorious things, but times have moved. Some yeah. of us, or many of us, fail to recognize, accept, oh, that those revolutionary times were required probably. Now, the world is much more informed and much more transformed, so we may not need those kind of bloodshed. But some of us feel, this one, and, and another group might feel that our ancient past was glorious. So, how will you take it up? So, it's a kind of, to me, an escape. Hmm. Uh, I don't know what the learners will feel. But sure. one thing is sure, sure, human mind, though I live in, we live in 2020, we don't actually live in the current present we live in the past because we have been carrying the past on our shoulders and in mind and we also keep our future in mind. So, the time past, time present and time future, I think T.S. Eliot's poem, no? T.S. Eliot's poem where he says um, that time future and time present are contained in the time past. So, he puts the onus on history for everything that we are what we are because of what we have been, because of our context. It's a complicated idea. Oh, yeah. Yeah, let, but let, the let, past has definitely got a lot of bearing um, on our present, and which is why we are so um, uh, obsessed with uh, historical debates. If it were merely fact, it would not matter. But it's it's a matter of opinion and interpretation always, which is why history matters. Right. So, learners, Amit pointed out the poem T. S. Eliot, four quarters. Eh? Yeah. Uh, four quarters. It talks about past, present. You may not understand day, but take a look at it. Come sure. on. And then the next question. Next question is, what do people do with the first day envelope? Well, it's a very, very informative question. You, you said it very well. When a new stamp or an envelope is released in memory of something or, a, or an occasion, people buy the envelope, but they don't want to send to others because they want to keep it. It's a treasure for a flatulist or stamp collector. So they put an, a, a blank paper into it and paste it, seal it, then address to themselves, themselves, address to themselves so that they can keep it themselves. That's what. Mm -hmm. And even today, uh, I have done it for myself. Mm -hmm. And I remember in uh, 10 years ago, some important occasion, it's relating to my place uh, that uh, then I posted to myself. So, it's a treasure. I don't want somebody to take because generally it is sold at higher price. No? Right. Uh, that's also there. Amit, uh, I'm going to ask you a very, very probably intriguing question mm -hmm. to you learners. Who wrote the first day cover, the letter to Charlie, which he, you read out to the learners right. now? So, the letter, as the book says, the note is signed Sam. Sam. At the same time, the story ends with a very curious statement. Sam was my psychiatrist. So, the same psychiatrist who had been saying that Charlie is hallucinating is um, Sam, the is the best friend and has gone back to 1894 and has posted the first day cover to himself, Fine. which means yeah. that he could be the grandfather of Charlie as well. Yes. The best friend is the grandfather, is the psychiatrist. He is all in one. Co convince me, as a reader, yeah. uh, now I am saying that his grandfather, this letter is, again, uh, Charlie is hallucinating. This letter was one of those letters his grandfather received. Yeah. And we again, I'm asking you. Yeah, so this is open-ended. Okay. It is how you would like to believe it. He could be hallucinating. He could have written the letter to himself, for all you know. But it being a science fiction story, yes. um, and while reading a text, um, if you study literature also at the university level, uh, learners, 
you will see that you have to text take the text at its value and read from within it. Um, that is the best way to read a text, do a close reading. And so, according to this text, according to the narrator, so the narrator who is Charlie himself may be a deceiving narrator, he may be not telling you uh, what, that. yeah, so it is truth for him. Yes. But for him, and it is a science fiction story, so you have to take it as fantasy. So, here he collapses the psychiatrist, the friend and the grandfather all into one character, Fine. which is also a very intense kind of a statement of saying all people are one, collapsible into the one. The one who lived in 19th century yeah. and the one uh, who living in 1950s yeah. are the same in a way. Yeah, in a way. Uh, uh, in a that way. human emotions do not change. Much. Yeah. 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 All right. Learners, uh, these are the questions. Deliberately, we didn't do the multiple choice inform information based questions because this story has lot to unfold, lot to uh, uh, learn about. So please read and some of the interpretations we did uh, through some eight nine questions, or uh, just to understand the story and to interpret the story in our own way. Learners and Amit, uh, we have come to the uh, end of the part one of this lesson the third level. So, we read, interpreted, made attempts to understand in different levels and discussed some of the ideas, events and even the layers of meaning, different layers of meaning, the themes to some extent and we stop it here. We will meet you uh, in the second episode part two of this lesson. Uh, thank you learners. Thank you very much Professor Meghnathan. Mm -hmm.